Desmond Thiambo is, I like to call him senior counsel. Tells me he's not yet there, but I'm sure he'll be there soon. He's a partner at KAT Advocates LLP. Um, I think Desmond, I'll let you take over and introduce yourself again and introduce the agenda for today and take us through the next section. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fred. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's, it, thank you for joining into the webinar for today. As Fred says, uh, I'm a partner at uh, Kieti Advocates LLP. I'm sure I'm familiar to, to some of you and to others. Um, it's a pleasure meeting you virtually, yes. So today we'll be discussing uh, leading teams in a virtual workspace and how I propose to go about the discussion, if I may just give you a brief overview. We will look at the opportunities that the virtual workspace gives us. Then we will look at the challenges and we will look at the success factors. And then finally, we will look at discipline management. So if we may begin, so um, I think many of us have been thrust into the virtual workspace because of changes in our social environment, you know, which has been brought about by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now with this pandemic, the, you know, the Ministry of Health in conjunction with the Ministry of Labor have advised uh, employers to you know, make sure that uh, social distancing is observed at their workplaces. So because of this new uh, dimension you know, that has sort of been imposed uh, on us, um, it has uh, given us uh, quite a number of opportunities that we did not realize uh, before. So the first uh, obvious opportunity is of course that there is enhanced safety for the knowledge-based workers. So if you have, uh, you know, in your organization, if you have uh, uh, jobs uh, that only require to process knowledge, for those kinds of, um, for those kinds of uh, uh, employees, it is not mandatory for them to, you know, to come to the office to carry out their tasks. They can be able to carry it out at home. Uh, but for tasks that, you know, is production based. So for instance, if you have technicians who have to go to the ground and maybe to install uh, a particular software or to you know, install, install some machinery, then for those, for those kind of workers, of course, they have to report to the, to the physical uh, workspace. But uh, the, the opportunity now that you know, working virtually has, has, has given, uh, given many organizations is that you can be able to implement it either fully or partially depending on the various uh, roles that you have in your organization. So if uh, some of your organizations are production-based uh, uh, workers, then having the knowledge-based ones, you know, working from home reduces the, the, the overall population you have in your office. So it is easier to be able to maintain the social uh, distancing in your seating arrangements or even in the communal areas, you know, your, your, tea, your tea places or your uh, cafeterias. So that, that is an immediate benefit. The, the other uh, benefit uh, opportunity with a virtual workspace is the synergy across borders. So this, the, this changes in, uh, in our social environment has really changed our mindset. You know, so before we thought that we can only collaborate or work with people who we are in the same building with, but now, you know, uh, having experienced, you know, the, you know, working from home, it has sort of changed our mindset and we have realized that we can actually collaborate with team members even across the globe, you know, from, from wherever they are located to achieve a particular task or to achieve a particular project. So the, the change in mindset, you know, has, has enabled us, you know, to be able to, to see that there are the opportunities for building synergies across, across borders. Then the other opportunity with a virtual workspace is that it promotes organizational learning. So what we mean by this is that there is need 
you know, with a virtual workspace, there's greater collaboration between the experienced workers and the less experienced workers. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a greater uh, need to share knowledge and, you know, to collaborate. So in, in that way, the whole organization is able to benefit, you know, especially from the senior employees, if I may call them that, who have some tacit knowledge that, you know, is just stored in their minds and is not uh, expressed in any written form. So, and in a physical workspace, they would probably, you know, carry it out by themselves. Uh, but because of the, the, the distancing uh, between fellow colleagues and so forth, there's a greater need to, to, share, to share that knowledge uh, to achieve the, the intended outcome. Yeah. So those are the opportunities. Of course, with the virtual workspace, there are still ch challenges that come with it. And uh, some of the challenges uh, that has, has come with it is that, uh, you know, the, the level of communication uh, technology tools and skills that we have. So if um, an organization has not invested enough in the, te in the communication technology tools, uh, for instance, if you've only been used to using email, and maybe that is the only form of, uh, you know, uh, technology that you use to communicate, then of course you you don't you are not able to tap in you know to the full uh, you know you are not able to collaborate with your team members you know at optimum levels and then of course also there is the skills um, of using these tools uh, so I think um, may, some people many of us have had to you know learn how to uh, conduct a Zoom meeting or conduct a Zoom training um, so. You know the skills depending on the level of skills of your team members it can it can either be a, a, a limitation or you, know, you might find that uh, you, are, you are in a good place so that that is a challenge the other challenge is self-leadership skills so working from home or working virtually because you are not all in the same office environment where your supervisor is able to see what you are doing then it requires your team members you know, to have stronger self-leadership skills so that they're able to carry out their tasks, you know, as required with minimal supervision. Uh, so where the, the, the self-leadership skills are weak, of course, you find that, um, you know, the output is not as good as, as expected. The other challenge is uh, emotional intelligence. In a virtual workspace, the team leader requires a higher degree of emotional intelligence to be able to, you know, to know uh, how your staff are doing without the benefit of uh, being able to read uh, their body language like you would in a face-to-face in -face meeting. And um, so leaders are finding that emotional intelligence comes into play and it's very critical uh, in leading um, a, a virtual team. And we'll be looking at, uh, you know, how we can um, you know, improve our emotional intelligence a, a little bit later. Then team cohesion. So if uh, you had not worked together as a team for, you know, for a considerable period of time before you proceeded to work virtually, you may find that there are teething problems in, in terms of uh, building trust within the team. Or you might find that uh, you know um, you know just being able to to understand how the other person, uh, your, the other team members operate uh, may take some time you know, um, in, in a virtual uh, workspace, and we'll be looking at you know how we can build on on, on that team cohesion. And then the other challenge is uh, negative norms can go undetected. What I mean by negative norms is that, for instance. Um, which is uh, something that may occur in a virtual workspace is what we call social loafing. So social loafing is where you find that a team member does not you know, carry out um, his, his or her responsibility and is deriding you know, on others. So because they are not you know, um, in a physical workspace where the supervisor can be able to easily detect their individual contribution, then they can easily joyride on others, especially if 
you know, you, the, the team has a single output, you know, uh, that, that, goes, that goes out to the client. So those are norms that can, can easily go and, and detected. So we'll be looking at how, you know, we can overcome uh, some of these norms. So the success factors for virtual teams, we'll look at this from both a leadership perspective and from a, leader, and from a legal perspective. Uh, and we'll be looking at, you know, how, how can we overcome the challenges that we've uh, highlighted uh, before. So the first one uh, is a variety of communication channels. So as a leader, just make sure you invest in more than one communication channel. Uh, so you could have, for, for instance, email, you could have uh, virtual whiteboards, uh, and you could also invest in uh, video conferencing uh, tools. So it would mean, for instance, you have to subscribe you know, to either Zoom as an organization or to Microsoft Teams uh, just to enable um, your, you to be able to meet with your team members uh, uh, virtually. Um, and yeah, so a variety of communication channels is important. And then just give your team members the freedom to choose what works best for them. As uh, team leaders, we have a weakness of uh, imposing a particular channel, and maybe it is because on, it is on the recommendation of a consultant. So, you know, we, you know, we believe that that is the only thing that can work, but it could help, you know, just finding out from them from time to time whether the channels you are using are effective, uh, are effective enough. Uh, for the particular objective that uh, you desire to achieve at a given time. And then social awareness. So both social awareness and relationship management goes towards our emotional intelligent, intelligence as leaders. And social awareness is just being aware of uh, where your employees are you know, emotionally. Uh, it, 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 is, it might not be easy to decipher your, your employee's emotion in an email. Um, so it, it might be beneficial, for example, to, to use a different channel of communication from time to time. Uh, for instance, in, in, in our office, we normally have a, a departmental meeting every Monday morning via, via Microsoft Teams, so we meet virtually. And in that meeting, it is just to find out, you know, how everybody's weekend was, you know, how they are doing, how their families are doing, you know, are they ill, you know, are they undergoing any, any challenges, whether personal or work-related. So that kind of uh, interaction before you actually delve into the main tasks, either at the late of the day or in the course of the week, helps you as a leader to be aware know what is really going on with your team members then once you become aware of what is going on with them that will help you manage your relationships with them so in, in uh, so in, and in managing your relationships with them you might realize that perhaps frequent communication may be necessary you know so that you can be able to build uh, that team cohesion um, and then also it would help you, for example, to be, uh, to be a listener. So as a leader, you'll have to, be, to, to listen more actively you know, through a virtual, uh, virtual medium uh, and, and empathetic listening. And then also part of relationship management is that um, it's a good habit to praise your team, team members you know, from time to time. So at least when they do something good, you know, just praise them to lift their spirits up. Um, so you may find that uh, you know, for some of us in our organizations, we've had to to take to you know to effect some changes to cope with the with the economic times. So some some of our team members are perhaps on a reduced salary, so they might be going through uh, you know stress, and it would be good to praise them from time to time just to to lift their spirits so that they are able to uh, so that all of you as a team are able to pull through uh, you know, this uh, this season and then plenty of structure would also help so if uh, you know because you are 
you are working virtually and to ensure that each team member is carrying their weight, it would be good to have uh, you know, clear objectives uh, for each team member um, you know, where you have uh, their roles and responsibilities you know, clearly outlined so that everyone knows what their deliverables are. And then it would also help to document some of the work processes, especially for the, you know, the, the, the new team members. So you know, the senior team members are able to help the new recruits you know, blend into the team much faster if some of the work processes are already documented. So you know, they can easily refer to them. And then face-to-face -face -face meeting early on for new recruits. So in as much as um, you, know, you, you can work virtually, um, for, for new recruits, uh, research has shown that uh, you know, at the early stages, it is, it is important for them to be able to at least meet their team members face to face, um, you know, uh, because nothing has really replaced that need for bonding as a team, uh, you know, which happens in a face to face meeting. And so early on, it's, it's an important thing to try and do. Of course, uh, you, you will make sure you implement the social distancing requirement, uh, but it would be good for them to at least meet uh, their team members face to face. Yeah. Yes, then from a legal perspective. Um, Desmond, I don't know if it's okay to jump in at this point, uh, just to belabor. Um, yes, sure. One of the points you had about communication, I think we've seen that really work. That um, uh, there's no over communication during this period because everyone else is. Uh, we are in a you know in a situation of uncertainty, and I think the more you communicate, the better for the teams. Uh, you know, we've seen folks for in, a, in our case even uh, you know creating a group on WhatsApp with just any chit chat to be helpful. Uh, officially, we use you know channels like Slack for you know, just keeping the team working together, um, an email for the formal conversation. So I, I thought that's a really great point to just add on that, uh, you know, there is no over communication. I've, I've had people ask, is it too much? Is it too less? I think the more you do it, the better. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, like you've rightly pointed out, that uh, it uh, builds on our social awareness. We're able to know what's going on with them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So, from from a legal perspective, um, the, the 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 labor laws impose a general duty on on all uh, organizations to promote, you know, good good labor relations, and uh, you know the the courts have uh, you know tried to interpret or define what good labor relations is. In the Employment Act itself, there's no definition of what a good labor relation is, but the courts have tried you know, to give clarity on this, and they have said that you know, beyond what you would provide in a contract uh, of employment, uh, for example, the, you know, the remuneration and so forth, you, as a leader, you have the responsibility to provide a conducive uh, working environment. So that duty still carries on even in a virtual uh, workspace, you know, just to make sure that, you are, you, you know, that, uh, that that space is still conducive and, and implementing uh, whatever, it, whatever is needed to, to, to make it as conducive as possible. So we have cited a case there for, for reference, which you know, tries to explain what, um, you know, the need for a, a conducive uh, working environment. And then, uh, of course, um, in, in as much as, uh, as team leaders, we may uh, put in the best practices, both from a leadership and um, a legal perspective, there are instances where you know, we may have to carry out some uh, discipline management uh, because you know, a team member you know, has, is not you know, pulling their weight despite the interventions that we have, we have put in place. So I'd just like us to run through you know, what you can do in terms of discipline management um, um, and then the legal requirements that, that come with it. 
So common types of disciplinary actions is verbal warning, uh, written warning, suspension, uh, demotion, transfer, and summary dismissal, uh, which is actually termination from employment. So I'll only look at, uh, briefly, I'll look at verbal warning, uh, the written warning, and the summary dismissal, um, so that at least we're able to manage our time well. But I'm open to any questions that you may have during the question and answer time. So verbal warning, normally used for petty crimes or minor breaking of rules. So for instance, if uh, you know what we call the social laughing, a team member not carrying their weight, uh, or you know any other form of abuse of time, you know you can, uh, as a first instance, you may you may decide just to warn them verbally. And if I can give an illustration, uh, you might uh, all remember when we saw uh, in the news uh, the chief justice warning the judges that uh, they are not on holiday. You know, uh, the fact that they are working virtually uh, does not mean that they're on holiday. Uh, they have to make sure that they are actually carrying out the tasks and that uh, it will form you know, uh, part of their appraisal on how many judgments and how many rulings they are able to deliver and at, a, at the end of a particular period. So a verbal warning may be sufficient uh, in a particular time. Um, so I will let you, these slides will be available to you. So there are procedures on how you can uh, reprimand uh, or carry out the verbal warning to a, to a team member. So you'll be able to you know, go through them uh, by yourselves, you'll be able to read them. I think that they are quite fairly straightforward. So I'll just skip to the written warning. So for the written uh, warning, this one now is normally for more serious offenses. So, and also in the situation where you have a minor offense that is repeated. So for example, now in the case that we have used on the, on the social law thing, if somebody is repeatedly not, um, you know, carrying out their responsibility or, you know, bringing, carrying, you know, bringing their contribution, then you may, you may decide to use a warning letter. And the warning letter normally remains in their personnel uh, file and the consequences of a warning letter, depending on the policy that you have as an organization, is that, uh, the, that team member may not be eligible for a promotion for, for, for a period of a year or may not be eligible for a salary increase or a bonus. So it is more. It's, it, it is more. It has more serious uh, consequences than, than, than a verbal, a verbal warning. There are procedures as well to comply with when uh, before you decide to give uh, a written warning letter, and um, you know uh, you you'll be able to go through through these procedures. I will we'll share the slides with you so that you can you can see how how, how to you know, what needs to be done before you issue a, a warning letter. We go to summary dismissal. So in the event that um, the offense committed is, um, is a serious uh, misconduct, and uh, this will normally be judged by the consequences of the conduct. So for instance, if, um, if a, a team member was supposed to carry out a certain task and because they didn't carry out the task, you either lost out, lost out on a contract or a client was you know, uh, very disappointed and you ended up losing the client, you, you may decide you know, to, to terminate uh, at this particular uh, employee from, from your employment. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you feel, and, and the yardstick here is really whether, you know, that relationship of trust and confidence you know, has, has, has been eroded. That, that is the yardstick. So there are certain safeguards though, that the law provides that we must adhere to even before we dismiss somebody from employment. So, and one is the aspect of fairness, and fairness is looked at both as uh, substantive fairness and procedural fairness. So substantive fairness is, you know, whether the reason for termination is valid. And when you're looking at uh, whether the reason is valid, you know, 
um, you may find, for example, as a human resource manager or as a CEO, you know, one of your uh, departmental heads report, uh, reports, uh, reports one of your employees to you. you know. So your responsibility then is just to do some preliminary investigation just to establish whether or not what, uh, what has been reported actually occurred. And then also you make sure that it is a fair reason. It relates to their conduct uh, and to their performance. Uh, you know, the same procedure of fairness, uh, you must ensure that they, you also adhere to the procedure of fairness. So, um, and there are three main things that you, you, you should adhere to that are provided by the act as a minimum. One is an explanation of the reason you know, before you, uh, in a language that the employee uh, understands, before, you know, that you are actually considering the termination. And then the, these em employees uh, have a right to be had. And then you must also hold a disciplinary meeting where they have a right to be accompanied by a fellow colleague. So the steps in, in disciplining, we have outlined the steps um, which you can be able to follow. So um, perhaps Fred, if I'm not running out, on, out of time, I can maybe quickly go through it in about five minutes or so. Five minutes will do. Okay. So the steps in disciplining an employee, as I said, um, first of all, is just to conduct an investigation, you know, to establish the facts and to review the evidence. And then, um, you know, being able to then speak to the employee concerned, you know, just to establish uh, you know, what happened. So be firm, clear, and approachable in your request, um, you know, and just address the issue directly. You know, sometimes for some of the team leaders, we do, we have a difficult time in, in, in addressing the issue, but, uh, these are one of the instances where you just have to address it directly and then give the employee an opportunity to respond and just engage in a conversation. So listen actively and, you know, and, and attentively. You may do this in a face-to-face -face meeting, either you invite them at the office or you may do this virtually or, or even over the telephone. What is important is that you engage them. Then from that initial engagement, if you see that an offense was probably committed, then the legal requirement is that you have to formally issue them with a show cause letter. And, and so a show cause letter, you know, uh, basically invites them to explain or to show cause why disciplinary action should not be meted against them. There are requirements, minimum requirements that a show cause letter must have you must give reasons for the contemplated dismissal and then give them a reasonable period to respond. Uh, so for instance, don't give them the, or send them an email in the morning and tell them I need a response in an hour. Just give them a reasonable period. This, it will vary from depending on the infraction in question. And then in that same letter, just, uh, inform them that they have the right to be accompanied by a colleague or a union representative uh, at a disciplinary meeting. In the disciplinary meeting, just uh, it is good where possible to have a disciplinary committee uh, that would either in, in, include the direct supervisor or different from the direct supervisor to avoid the perception of uh, you know, a mere formality or you know, a predetermined outcome. And then uh, before the meeting starts, just have an attendance sheet make, to make sure that you have a record of who attended and then keep minutes of the meeting. You may need them for reference purposes. Afterwards, have adequate time for deliberations. And then if the decision is to terminate, then make sure you give the reasons the results of your deliberations and the reasons for termination in writing. And then in your letter of termination, also just set out the dues that uh, as per the contract that will be given to them. And then also give them a certificate of service. 
So a certificate of service is simply just says they worked in your organization from this date to this date in this specific role. It is not a recommendation, um, neither is it, um, you know, uh, yeah, it is not a recommendation. So you don't have to say that they were a good employee or you don't have to say that they were a bad employee. It's just, it's just a plain uh, record to show that they worked in the organization. So in conclusion, if you are, as team leaders, if we are able to use both uh, the leadership uh, leadership uh, perspectives and the legal compliance will be able to have a, success, a successful uh, a virtual team. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Desmond. Uh, if there was a way to clap virtually, I think you can note that we have done that. Um, thanks for that conclusion that, you know, at the end of the day, it's about leadership and compliance to be able to successfully you know, lead virtual teams. Um, I hope we've, you know, we've taken a lot from that. Um, this is the next session where we allow you to ask us questions. I see there are some that have already come in. Uh, before we get into that, um, we have a poll that we would like to hear from you. It's a very simple three questions. Um, I'm going to launch it. You'll see it on your, should be your right side of your screen. If you're on mobile, I'm not sure, but something should pop up on your screen. Um, we just want to understand how you as a manager are coping in this environment. Um, you can be able to choose, you know, it's a yes, no, yes, no. You can select the options. You know, it should take you through less than a minute to be able to fulfill that. Then on my end, I can be able to see, you know, how many people have actually responded. So we'll, we'll give you feedback right now. Um, so the... I think the question, second, second question made a, made a cut off. The question is, how are you coping with leading virtual teams? Uh, that's a question, sorry. I think it looks like a few, a word or two is missing. All right, you got in about 40% of you have already, you know, polled. I don't know if, if you guys are able to see the poll results, are you? Is it just me? Desmond, are you seeing the poll results on your end? No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not seeing, uh, I'm not able to see it. I guess it's my privilege. Uh, I'll share, I'll share the results in, uh, let's see, 72% of us have to wait for a few others to do that. All right, 10 more seconds, then you're done with that poll. All right, so we've got in 79, 80% of you have uh, polled. Um, the first question is, has your team been fully remote during this pandemic? 52% uh, of you have said yes, 22% of you have said no, and 26% have said it's rotational. Uh, it would be good to understand for those who are saying that, you know, they've not been fully remote. It would be good to really understand how that has worked out and how you're managing to implement uh, the measures um, to prevent spread of COVID. And then the second question, how are you coping with leading the virtual teams? Um, I'm impressed that, you know, majority are saying very well, 30%. 39% uh, are saying okay. Um, then 26% are saying it could be better. So again, it would be good to understand where we can, um, you know, Desmond is here to help with that bit. And 4% are saying it is a struggle. So again, it would be good to understand what a struggle is but at least 69% either okay or very well. And the last question is, what are you struggling with the most at the moment? And 30% uh, are saying communication technology tools and skills. 30% uh, again are saying emotional intelligence. 
Um, but majority are saying self-leadership skills. Um, I guess the, the, that individuals are not able to carry out to own responsibilities and lead themselves. And then 30% team cohesion and another 30% negative norms can go undetected. Um, Desmond, I think just, just to weigh in on this, the third bit where most people are saying they're struggling with self-leadership skills, what would you like to you know, add to them? Yes, for, for the self-leadership skills, um, I think what would help a great deal is um, you know, just having plenty of structure for your team members. Um, you know, if uh, you, you let your team members just um, determine for themselves you know, the tasks that they need to carry out, uh, some of them may not have the required motivation to be able to do what needs to be done. So setting out clear objectives for them, you know, perhaps uh, you know, from time to time, maybe what uh, would, would they help in, 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 a, in such a particular instance uh, so that at least they know that even though they are working from home, they still have deliverables that they have to you know, uh, meet. And perhaps the other thing is you know, to come up with different um, ways of uh, measuring performance. You know, so in a traditional office setup, you know, it is uh, the person who comes to the office on, in, on that day, you assume that that person is working. But perhaps, uh, you know, maybe using uh, timesheets. You know, so maybe you have your team members submitting timesheets so that you're able to, to monitor their performance uh, could be something that you may choose to employ. So looking at a, you know, a variety of tools that, you know, to measure performance other than uh, physical presence uh, is what we've traditionally you know, been used to. Yeah. Uh, maybe just to add on to what Desmond you said, um, and, and touching both self-leadership and communication and technology tools, um, we have a process where the leadership teams, the managers will every morning send a hit list. So a hit list is the things that they are intended, they are supposed to do and they're supposed to do in collaboration with other you know, team members. Um, so we do this you know, every morning by 9 a.m. The hit list is sent for every account that we manage. Um, and we use a channel called Slack you know, um, that you know, allows us to do communication to, uh, you know, in a way that is a bit informal and agile. You know, we don't necessarily always have to send an email with all the details. Um, so we've seen that really work well uh, because then it makes it very clear that this is a task that needs to be done by someone. And then there's visibility across board. Uh, I guess we've always wanted visibility, but we knew it from, you know, physically seeing in the office. Um, so you could combine that, you know, with, you know, whatever works for you, timesheets or project management tools, a couple of project management tools out there, you know, uh, online that, you know, you can be able to really, put out your task that needs to be done and you as a manager, you can be able to have oversight, you know, what, what people are doing. Uh, so I thought I would be able to share that from my experience. Uh, there's a lot of comments on emotional intelligence. Desmond, do you want to add on to that in terms of how do we, how do you get people to be more <laughs> emotionally intelligent? You know? <laughs> yes, well, it, um... This depends. So, for it, for it depends on uh, whether it is from the team leader or from from the team members. So, from from, from the team leader, of course, um, you know, just as I mentioned before, it, it begins with that. With just being uh, developing your social awareness. So, you know, um, just being able to know what is really going on with your with your team members. So, and where we are at the world, you know, at the moment, we are moving you know, from management to leadership. So management, you know, is more of, um, you know, looking out to see or, you know, waiting for, uh, for your team members to make a mistake and then to punish them, punish them. But leadership now requires that you take a more proactive uh, approach and, and just find out what, the underlying reasons, you know, and, uh, you know, so it, it, it causes for perhaps 
more interaction uh, you know with your team members and and probably just a variety of communication tools to be able to know what's going on it helps before you start a departmental meeting just to find out how everybody is doing you know uh, mm -hmm. yeah so you just just to know how everybody is doing you you, you may you may just be surprised that um, somebody is facing uh, you know severe or is facing serious uh, struggles uh, at an individual level so it, it helps uh, just to build up that social awareness and then yeah. also yeah yeah you want to add something to that Fred? i'm sorry just wrote, just go out, go ahead yeah yeah and then of course uh, uh the it goes on also to we had also I'd already mentioned about the relationship management the listening skills is what come into play so as a leader i think it, it might be a good time also now to listen more you know so talk less and listen more to your to your team members um, you know you may be able to pick up some cues you know, just as they're as they're talking you, know, you may be able to pick up on something on what they are going through you know, yeah. As they talk. Yeah. yeah thank you thank you desmond i think i'll jump to some of the questions we have um we have a question from anonymous um asking as a team leader how do i know my team members are doing what they are supposed to do virtually um, I think we may have answered that, but I don't know if it does want you to add, to add an additional point to that. No, no, no. I think I think we've we've, we've answered in terms of setting out uh, clear objectives and responsibilities and roles for each uh, for yeah. each team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, then Joseph is asking, "Hey, Desmond, for virtual teams, how would you incentivize uh, reward virtual teams?" Okay. I think for virtual teams, a team-based reward would probably be the most uh, most appropriate, as opposed to an individual uh, re individual reward. So you know, if uh, a particular team, so for example, in your organization, if you have several teams, uh, and uh, a particular team uh, meets uh, achieves its uh, objective, you may give a reward. You know, to that whole team, and the rewards may vary, you know, from financial um, you know, to to non-financial rewards. But it is important that it is a team a team reward, so that you encourage collaboration. Because if you only give an individual reward, it will encourage people to be individual stars. And there will be less need uh, to collaborate with others. Um, so here is where you will need to be. Um, you know, a little bit more creative in, in, in the kinds of, uh, of, of rewards that uh, you, you can give to a particular team. You know, perhaps you can, you, you can uh, 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 promise them a holiday when the restrictions are lifted for the whole team. <laughs> or, a, yeah. you know, or a, you know um, but it has to be a team-based reward. Yeah. As opposed to individuals, huh? as opposed to individuals, yes. All right. Um, he has an additional point. I think just to uh, finalize, with Joseph is: How would you make remote workers interact in more ways and with more people than just the people they work with directly? Sorry, just come again. Um, so still, not, still on Joseph. Huh? He's asking: How would you make remote workers interact in more ways? and with more people than just the people they work with directly. Okay, uh, this would um, call you to arrange your tasks in a way that would require, um, you know, probably set several people to collaborate. So it really goes how, on how you arrange your tasks. So if, if you arrange your task in such a way that it only requires the input of, of, you know, of two people out of seven, uh, team members, then of course, you know the the level of collaboration will be will be quite little. Um, so you want to make sure that you know you you you, you know you just uh, divide your your tasks in such a way that there's interdependence. You know, so for instance, if you are 
office if your office manager is is, is responsible for uh, making making sure that the communication goes out to the client but there's somebody else who's doing the creative process uh, and there's somebody else who's uh, proof editing you know so that interdependence rather than giving one person to do everything you just make sure that you have uh, you create uh, uh, more interdependence between your team members and that would help in building cohesion so when you're working in the virtual uh, space you you don't have the benefits of many team building exercises although there are still some that are available but just being able to to organize your tasks you know for greater interdependence would make sure that your team members are working with uh, more than you know with more people than the, the usual people they work with yeah yeah and i think um, just to add on there's quite a number of um webinars being carried out by different organizations that's still an opportunity for them to expand and talk to more people you know beyond their usual circles uh, and also collaborate and uh, network with more people as well virtually of course um there's a comment from azam um um, says um, I'm able to offer a number of training programs on subjects that would help with self leadership, uh, productivity, procrastination, growth mindset, and habit building. Are all sessions that I've been doing as keynotes in the past and virtually since COVID nineteen. These are typically programs that we charge for, but I'm happy to discuss this with you further. Um, Azam, would you like to, you know, just to elaborate further how you do this and how you'd like. You know, those who are interested to join you. Um, you can raise your hand and I'll let you, I'll allow you to speak. All right, Azam, go ahead. You can unmute your hand and speak. Sure, thanks, Fred. Can you hear me okay? We okay. Uh, sorry, it was more meant as an offline message to you and to Dad. Desmond, but, uh, but thank you for reading it out. Um, basically, what we've been doing is previously I was doing training programs for management teams, and it would be done as a keynote session and then some follow up sessions with next steps uh, and check ins to make sure that things are being implemented. Um, what we've been doing now is much more customized. Um, there are general webinars like covering growth mindset, attacking procrastination looking at productivity systems and how do you integrate all of these electronic and virtual tools. Um, but then depending on the organization, there's one company, what I've done is for their management team of 12 people, we're actually doing a four week series where we do a webinar at the beginning of the week. Um, three days later, we do a follow up on some implementation homework. And then we end the week looking at how did we uh, roll this out to their teams. And then the next week we tackle the next subject. Um, but since I'm the one doing it uh, and I'm doing the work myself, uh, it can be fully customized based on what an organization needs. Some organizations just want a way to connect with their people and make them feel like they're part of a team. Others are having real organization and communication issues. Um, so it is pretty flexible, uh, but I'm happy to take that conversation offline with anybody. Right. I think thanks, thanks a lot for mentioning that. Um, we've seen that majority of people are struggling with, you know, self-leadership. So this, this could be useful. Um, if you don't mind, you could share your personal details to, you could send it on chat or how people can reach you so that if anyone is interested, they can follow up with you. Sure. I'll do that right now. Thank you. Azam. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Azam. All right. There's another question from anonymous. Um, it's a bit of an IT question. It says the department, IT department had recommended that we use Microsoft Teams and Skype for business. But due to certain circumstances, my team decided, decided to use Zoom and Google Meet. Uh, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but I guess maybe to try to ask on his behalf or her behalf, is it what happens in a scenario where you know, companies recommend this and uh, individuals opt for another way of doing things. Yes, um, you, 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 do you like me to take that question? Yeah, you, um, so basically how I think it's trying to find a middle ground between what the company wants in terms of the communication tools to be used 
yes. versus what individuals may prefer to be used. Should people stick to what the company is asking you them to do, or should is there liberty for people to try what really works for them or what they're more comfortable with? What I would encourage is consultation. So for the team members, if your team leader has recommended something that is not working well, or you have uh, an, an, another channel that you would prefer to use, it would be best to just let them know that you have, you know, something else which you think that works, you know, works better. And, you know, because you might find that there's a particular reason that maybe they recommended uh, what, uh, you know, what, what to use, maybe security reasons and so forth. So it, consultation, I think, is key. Just consult with them and let them know so yeah. that, uh, you know, you are uh, working from, uh, yeah, you know, with one, right. one mind. Absolutely. Right. Uh, I think Joseph is also recommending a platform called Team Doctor, which provides additional time management. So you, I guess you can Google that. Um, Azam, you've shared your contacts. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I hope everyone has gotten that. Please make sure you get it before the webinar ends because then uh, will be, um, that would be uh, deleted or moved. Um, so Desmond, I think we are five minutes to the end of our session. What are your final remarks? What would you like the team to take away with, to go home with? Oh, they already home, uh, basically. You know, what, I, what would you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so I, I think um, in, in a virtual space as team leaders, we have to be more intentional. I think that is what I would uh, like everyone to, to go with. Uh, so, you know, we have to be more intentional to be able to achieve uh, a successful uh, virtual team. And uh, we'll be able to share these resources with you. We'll also give recommendations. There are resources you can be able to find out more about building your emotional intelligence, uh, both for team leaders and team members, because also for team members, it is good to be able to know if your leader is, uh, uh, is not in the mood to discuss something, perhaps, you know, just how do you, discern that so that perhaps you bring up the issue at a later time. Um, you know, uh, so there are resources we may be able you know, uh, to share, uh, to share with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Desmond Odiambo. Um, I think my takeaway, you've said that uh, it's time to shift from management to leadership. Um, so I hope this for myself, I think I've learned a lot um, in terms of how I've probably be able to manage my team better or lead my team better. And hopefully we've all done that and we've, you know, gotten aware of this more informed and more uh, better leaders at the end of the day. Uh, thank you for making time to join us. Thank you for the, you know, one hour of your time. I know we busy people, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you for that. Um, you'll be getting this materials in your email. Uh, we'll also have our next webinar in two weeks time is with Twitter. We're doing Twitter Amplify. If you want to know, you know, how to use Twitter for your communication, um, for your marketing, uh, whether personal or brand, you know, this, that would be a great conversation. Um, you'll be getting that information in your email and we look forward to having the next session. Thank you. Thank you. And take care. Stay safe.